I'm Matt Dixon, and welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. The mission of Purple Patch is to empower and educate every human being to reach their athletic potential. Through the lens of athletic potential, you reach your human potential. The purpose of this podcast is to help time-starved people everywhere integrate sport into life. All right, guys, just before we get going with the show, you might not be racing Kona this year. In fact, you might be coming to the end of the season, or perhaps you're just a fitness enthusiast that never toes the start line. But now is the time of the year that I tend to get most of my one-to-one athletes that I coach individually to have a little pause, reflection, and look inside. Yes, it's a wonderful time to begin to set a strategic roadmap so that they can build a platform of health, strength, and performance over the coming winter months. Now, a key tool in the toolbox for this that we tend to leverage is Inside Tracker. It enables us to have a deep dive review of all of the biometrics and from that gain specific recommendation advice from the team of experts at Inside Tracker so that we can implement interventions that are going to help them facilitate performance and improved health. The nice part of it is it's all trackable. Wonderful suite of metrics, a very easy dashboard, so you can see the gains that you're receiving from all of the hard work that you put in. The good news is you don't need to be coached by me, or in fact, even coached by Purple Patch in order to benefit. All you have to do is head to insidetracker.com slash purplepatch. That's insidetracker.com slash purplepatch, and you can use a very handy code Purple Patch Pro 20. That's Purple Patch Pro 20. And guess what? You get 20% off everything at the store. All right, with that, it is a biggie today. Let's get on with the Purple Patch Podcast. And welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. As ever, your host, Matt Dixon. And today, I get to put on my Ironman Master Coach hat. And in addition to that, I get to draw from the 15 years of experience that I've had from helping athletes thrive at the Hawaii Ironman World Championships. Yes, it is everything you need to know about succeeding in Kona. It is a big, robust show today. Now, Purple Patch has been privileged to actually guide more than 750 athletes to qualification at the World Championships. We've also coached multiple age group world champions, and we've had numerous Purple Patch pros sparkle in the top 10 overall. Of course, some of those results include the famous race in 2009 with Chris Lieto, who just narrowly missed out on the win, Rachel Joyce's succession of top five finishes, Sarah Piampiano's unbelievable personal performances, and many more. But today is all about you, or maybe your competing friends, and helping you or them set up your best Hawaii Ironman experience. I am going to go full hog today. And what we're going to do, because it's such a meaty episode, we're going to break this into two parts. They're all going to be in today's show. But the whole first part, part one, is going to be all of the important insights that I can give you about what you need to do before you arrive on the island and nailing race week. Really, really important stuff. Unfortunately, this is where many athletes tend to ruin their performance potential through a series of mistakes that I don't want you to make. Once we've got through that, of course, then we get on to race day, and it's going to be all about race execution. Swim, bike, run, a little flash of nutrition and fueling, and of course, some mindset and navigating adversity. But before we get into this show, I do want to talk about Purple Patch coaching a little bit. And so I get to bring back to the show my favorite category, Matt's Newsings. For Matt's Newsings this week, I want to talk about Purple Patch coaching. Now, this is something that I'm really proud of. It's also something something that's a little bit personal, okay, with myself and the coaches. We've got a really small dedicated, cohesive group of coaches that love to support each other, work with each other so that individually we can help athletes like you thrive. And I honestly believe that there is a difference in the mindset and the application of how we tend to coach at Purple Patch. Now, I should preface, there are a ton of really smart coaches out there doing very good work. But unfortunately, one of the patterns that I see is many of the very smart coaches really struggle with the specific needs and schedules of time-starved athletes. 
they end up accidentally forcing athletes into their own system of being, their own coaching methodology, their communication schedule, and that creates friction, tension, some really challenging. In fact, the sport often becomes a monkey on the back rather than having a coach that can help accelerate your performance. Now, while it takes more work for us, the coaching team, we tend to take on a different lens of how to operate as coaches. We apply our methodology, and of course, you know that we have a distinct methodology, but we apply that methodology to each individual athlete, but build the specific approach around the specific needs of your schedule, your life, and the communication style and system that works for you. Our mission is to integrate into your life and build a fully custom program for you that fits into how you go about living. And so we then work to align our communication style, our feedback to support you, how it best suits you. And it's a really different way of doing. How I might coach Johnny is very different than maybe how I coach Jane while we're under the same system and methodology. Now, once we've got this up and running and flowing, then we can start to build some education, deep dive and support around all of the other areas that impact your performance. That might include things like sleep habits, nutrition, time management, anything else to ensure that your journey not only prepares you for race performance, but also positively improves your life and work performance. And this, this is the heartbeat and the difference of our one-to-one -one coaching to ensure that we build it around the needs and the systems of each individual athlete. Make it work for you. And it's why I believe we not only have a lot of success helping our athletes thrive in racing, but we're also really good at retaining athletes over the long term because it works for you. And I believe that this is the purple patch difference. And I think actually it is what all coaching should be. So if you're a coach out there, listen to that last section and perhaps think about applying it to your own methodology. If you're thinking of a change or an evolution, or maybe you're thinking about stepping into the dirty, murky world of coaching, why don't we set up a pressure-free chat? Reach out to info at purplepatchfitness.com. Let them know, why don't you, that you heard about the purple patch difference on this show. We'll then set up a pressure-free, no-strings-attached chat and see whether we're the right fit for you. I realize that we're not the right fit for every athlete, but when things do align and then performances sparkle. All right, with that, I hope you're inspired because we are going to spend the next block of time talking about Kona. I am excited. It's almost that time. And ladies and gentlemen, Barry, it is that time. It's time for the meat and potatoes. Yes, folks, it is the meat and potatoes, and my mission today is to set you up with the best possible experience on the island. But on top of that, I want to help you dodge many of the pitfalls that so many athletes stumble into. As I promised today, we're going to break this up into two parts. The first section of today's show is going to be all about before you arrive and race week. Then we're going to dive into race execution. And so if you think you've got one dialed section and not the other, at least you know what's coming. In part one of today's show, we're going to try and identify three big lessons for you. The first of the key strategies that you can implement right before you travel so that you arrive onto the island really fit, but also fresh, and you're ready to handle the craziness that makes up Kona Week. We're also going to go around to framework to optimize your actual race week there, how you plan the appropriate training so that you can start to sharpen and optimize and get ready while also maximizing the Kona experience, which if it is your first time getting ready for the Hawaii Ironman, it is a magical week. And finally, I'm going to add on a quick hit list of answers to some of the most common questions that we get from athletes around race week. Once we've passed with that, we can shake it off and we'll move on to talking about swim, bike and run on the actual race day. Without further ado, part one, let's get going. The reason that we're structuring it like this is, let me be clear, if you want to have a great race day in Kona and then a successful Ironman experience absolutely begins before you even step foot on the lava. Yes, before you even travel. And I want to begin to kick this off, this part one of the show. 
I want to dispel a huge myth out there, something that I hear athletes saying or actually their actions that lead them to this without realizing it, which is a huge common mistake. We see a lot of athletes fall into this and there are big performance consequences. The common mindset when you are juggling responsibilities of work and family and everything that makes up life with, of course, the training to get ready for this thing is the common mindset of charging at work until the day of travel. I want to have a clean slate in Hawaii. And so I'm going to do everything I can to finish up and cross all of the T's and dot all of the I's at work before I go. I'm going to also cram in my last minute training because I'm a little bit worried that I'm going to have the required fitness to actually navigate this beast of a race. And then what I'll do is I'll get onto the island and I'll spend race week recovering. That's where I'm going to sleep a lot, rejuvenate and freshen up. Let me start this show by saying, don't do this. It is absolutely a failing proposition. In fact, when you just put your foot down on the tarmac in Hawaii, you're going to realize that there is an amplified stress of the environment. Your expectations of race week are looming. The schedule and logistics becomes really demanding, and we'll get into that in a little bit. It's an incredibly harsh environment of both heat, wind, and humidity. And so many athletes leave their race performances in their hometown. In fact, as the antidote to this, let me establish your mission. Your mission and goal. And this is perhaps ironically the most important thing I'm going to say today. Your mission and goal is to arrive to Hawaii as systemically fresh as possible. You want to also be prepared physiologically to meet the conditions as best as you can. So you want to get there really fresh and already had some physiological adaptations in hand so that you are ready to navigate the heat. If you can achieve those two big things, and then what you can do in Hawaii is start to prime for the race. But what you don't want to get stuck in is desperately trying to rest your way out of a hole of fatigue. Now, what does this mean? This means that I would much rather you do two or three less training sessions, maybe a few less miles, but arrive a little bit fresher than just tipped over the edge and be systemically overcooked. So let's get tactical on this. What can you actually do to actually apply to this? Well, let's first talk about heat preparation. As I mentioned, it's an incredibly harsh environment. And so we have a heat protocol that we love athletes to go through. In fact, I'm going to break this down a little bit as a part of the show. But if you want the specific details of our heat protocol, we'd be happy to share with you. All you have to do is email info at purplepatchfitness.com and we'll be happy to send you the specific line by line of the protocol that our athletes leverage. But the quick headline news of this, your heat preparation begins about two weeks before your travel day. Not two weeks before race day, before your travel day. And the goal of this protocol, there are several ways to implement it and we'll go into it, but the goal of this protocol is to make you more effective at operating at heat. It's not about making the heat feel better or diminish how stressful and claustrophobic it is. It's going to be a little bit nasty, but we can boost physiological adaptations that are going to equip you to become a more effective cooling machine. Now, the way that this protocol works is really without getting too complicated into the physiology, we're going to boost your blood volume. So if an average human has about six liters of blood, hopefully circulating in an internal system within your body, by going through a little bit of heat stimulus, we can actually increase the amount of blood, six and a half liters, seven liters, whatever it might be. And that becomes really important to help you dissipate the heat that the body is generating. A second physiological adaptation that we're looking for is to increase your sweat rate. If you can increase and sweat more, you become a more effective cooling machine. And that's the outcome that we're looking for. So how can you do this before you get on that plane? Well, there are two options. The first option is what you might call the post-workout protocol. 
And that post-workout pro protocol is following every one of your sessions over those two weeks before you travel. For about 10 to 30 minutes, you put yourself in a relatively harsh environment. You can sit in a sauna. You can sit in a steam room. You can do hot water immersion where you're up to your neck in a hot bath that is continually running hot water to ensure that that temperature stays hot. And while you are doing that post-workout, you are not hydrating. And that's going to create a big stimulus, a little bit of a stress on the kidneys. In fact, it's going to release vasopressin, which is an antidiuretic to help you build up more body water or plasma, therefore boost your blood volume. Now, the important part, if you're going to implement this schedule, is it's really demanding psychologically to sit in there. It's not very comfortable and you're not hydrating. So in order to us to not impact negatively your training, once you're done with this and you've had a nice shower and you've refueled, over the next three to four hours, it's very important that you restore your hydration status. And I would encourage you to restore your hydration status with continuous fluids that include electrolytes. Really important. The other factor on this post-workout mm -hmm. protocol is that it is systemically stressful. And so if life is really busy, life, um, sleep is disrupted, maybe your training is feeling a little bit of fatigued, this would be thought of as the cherry on top of the overall platform of performance readiness and health. And you can remove that cherry and still have a lovely cake. In other words, if you are feeling a little bit overcooked, this is the very first thing to pull out with confidence from your overall protocol. So that's one way to go about a heat protocol. The second way is to actually integrate hot workouts into the equation. Now, this is where a lot of athletes make mistakes. The only place that you should put yourself in a synthetically hot environment by either layering on more clothes, so wearing woolly sweaters, if you want to call it that, or putting yourself into a, let's use an example, riding on the bike trainer with no fan in a hot room, that type of simulated heat stimulus, I only would want you to do that in non-key sessions. So some of the lighter sessions that are physiologically lower stress from a training standpoint. As I said, the way that you get this is adding clothes, removing fan, operating in a hotter environment. But it's important that we really retain the integrity, the quality of our key interval sessions. And so we want high performance on the sessions that are looking to challenge you to drive physiological changes, high intensity intervals, longer, very challenging workouts with Ironman specific intervals, some of the race simulation stuff. Don't go making yourself underperforming key training sessions because of this stimulus. Do it in the lower stress, easy workouts. And just like the post-workout protocol, you remove this if you're really physiologically or emotionally depleted. Really important. Okay. If you do that, if you execute that protocol over the course of 10 days to 14 days before you travel, it's going to be a stimulus to boost your blood volume, increase your sweat rate, make you a more, better cooling machine, not to make the heat and humidity of Hawaii feel better, but physiologically equip you to operate better. And I think that's an important thing. A lot of folks think they're going to arrive in Hawaii and think, oh, it feels like a cold day in Detroit in November. That's not what we're looking for here, okay? It's just about physiological adaptations. A second component then that you think about pre-travel so that you arrive fit and fresh is around hydration and specifically pre-hydration. The heat protocol that we talk about, I want you to get systemically fresh before you get on the plane. So I would encourage you to stop that heat protocol in the final 48 to 72 hours before you get on the plane. And as you remove that physiological stressor, you start to get a little bit fresh, but then we really go about looking to restore our full hydration status and get really, really vibrant and healthy. And hydration can help with that. So as you remove the heat protocol, you then add on the prehydration. Two to three days, 48, 72 hours before travel, I recommend that you focus 
on a little bit of pre-bed and wake up hydration. So before you go to bed, have a water bottle's worth of fluid, but I would also add in some electrolytes. Now, middle of the bell curve here, some folks need 500 milligrams, some salty sweaters might have a little bit more, 1,000 or 1,500. I'm gonna label it as middle of the bell curve, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, pure electrolyte, low calorie hydration. You have a bottle an hour or two right before bed. When you first wake up in the morning, you can still have your espresso or cup of tea that you like, but you also have another to hydrate the day, a thousand milligram either side of it, depending on what type of sweater you are, prehydration. Now, over the course of the day, then you start to hydrate similarly to how you will in race week. With every meal, you have a glass or two of water. You don't need to have electrolytes into that because you've got electrolytes in the meal. And then maybe at lunchtime, you might have one more prehydration electrolyte drink. That's about the mission that you have. You don't need to turn yourself into a camel. You don't need to be Gatorade, uh, strapping a bottle of Gatorade to your arm and walking around with it. Morning, evening, glass of water or two with meals, you're pretty much good to go. And you are going to fully restore hydration status before you get on the plane. All right, so we've got heat protocol. We're gonna do that for the two weeks before travel, stopping about 48 hours before. We've got a little bit of prehydration about 48 hours before as well, where we're gonna boost up our hydration status. And then in addition, you've got two other key factors. Avoid any really hard training in that final 48 hours. So I'm really looking to boost your systemic health. And in the last week or two before, if you can, really prioritize sleep. A cool, dark environment, making sure that before you get on that plane, and you are most likely going to have time zone shifts, you can get some really high quality sleep. We know that when you first get to the island, the first 24, 48, maybe up to 72 hours, you're going to have disrupted sleep. It's a new bed, a new environment, harsher conditions, you've got time zone shifts. So why don't you pad up some good health and go from there. All right, is there anything else that we can do pre-travel? Yes, the good news there is. You should absolutely focus on really high quality eating, tons of vegetables, lots of proteins, lots of good fats. As our training isn't particularly hard in that last couple of days before travel, you're probably having a good breakfast with plenty of carbohydrate. Don't shift your eating habits too much, but really make sure that you are getting plenty of vitamins, minerals, good proteins, good oils, that's gonna be the backbone of a really healthy diet to get going. If you can do this, if you can prevent that last minute work charge that we talked about, you can execute a heat protocol and you can get a really good platform of sleep, eating and prehydration and get onto that plane, not systemically tired, it can be race changing. It can truly be race changing. And it's a really important high value component. If you do this, you will have physiological adaptations to help you operate in heat better. You'll be systemically fresh, but most importantly, it frees up Kona week. You can move into priming and not desperation. And I think that is high, high value. Good, done. What about race week? This becomes really important as well. And oh, the excitement of race week. You are here, you've been training for the Hawaii Ironman World Championships. Everyone around you looks like they are significantly fitter than you. That's the common emotion that everybody gets, by the way. And there becomes a real tension, a balancing act over race week. Because ultimately, most athletes that are going to Hawaii there's a mission to really maximize the Kona experience. You wanna make sure that you have great fun and enjoy it. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity for many athletes. At the same time, on the other side of the equation, you don't wanna sabotage your race performance. You don't want to take action during race week that is gonna make the race day miserable and last much longer than you want it to do. So let's dial in the best approach for you. The first thing, and I mean this seriously, is plan your week. Actually being a little bit anal here, and for many of the listeners, that's not too hard, I know, I know because you're 
very type A, all of you Kona athletes, but it is worth having a schedule, being really highly organized. Now, I should preface this, that by having the plan and having the schedule, you will have to adapt and you should be okay adapting and managing. But with a framework to operate, it's going to remove a lot of the cognitive stress. Now, within this schedule, I would recommend a few things. First, your training. Typically, the vast majority of your training is better done first thing in the morning. The only little uh, shakeout of that or the difference of that is some athletes love to do a little pre-dinner shakeout or an easy swim or something like that. That's great. But the majority of your training for most Kona athletes, it's better to do it when it's cooler, a little quieter, get the training done. That's the important part because that's you priming your body and then go on with the really, really rest of the day. That becomes important. Now, when you do that training, it will still feel hot. There's a high likelihood that in the training sessions, you might not feel great or sparky. But remember that the training isn't there in Kona Week for you to chase validation. The role of it isn't to tell you that you are ready. You got ready over the last months of training. This is about getting the body and the blood moving, getting primed up, and over the course of the coming days, getting you systemically healthy enough to really have a great race performance without you feeling, as they call it in endurance terms, flat. So some work is important, but that work shouldn't be chasing validation that you're ready. That is a question that can only be answered on race day. Now, under the banner of training, a few tips that I can give you. Firstly, the swim is very busy. If you're going to do it in town, realize there's typically a lot of traffic in the town of Kona. Parking is very tough. You want to give yourself more time. If you're going to go and do a 15 to 20 minute swim, that's an hour of your schedule mapping. You should also consider riding safely. The riding in town can be very busy. A lot of people that are excited, a lot of locals that are maybe a little bit frustrated. It's often a good thing to get out of town a little bit, get out onto the highway and do some of the riding where you're not in the stoplights, not in the traffic coming out of the side. Uh, roads, etc. And I think that's really valuable if you can do that. And so if you're going to go and do an hour and a half or two hours on the bike, four or five days before the race, you want to think about that as a three hour block of time. So at least one and a half to two X the time that you'll actually be riding, that's what your schedule demands. In the run part of it, I absolutely recommend that you avoid the heat of the day. So run when it is cooler and absolutely ensure that you avoid ego running. So many athletes get out there, get excited, test themselves and run way too hard. Of the three disciplines, the running is the one that should be kept really quite easy in race week. It becomes important. So that's the training section in race week that's important. What about meals? Now, depends on your accommodation. I'd recommend plenty of cooking at home if you can. If dining out is the option, you should think about getting reservations. The dining in Kona, uh, it's not the best. The restaurants aren't high class. This ain't New York. And so I recommend getting good reservations well ahead, make a plan, schedule it, and eat on the earlier side. If you can be eating at 5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 p.m., I think that's going to give you a window to digest food and get to bed nice and early. Registration. You can register almost any day leading up to the race. I would recommend doing it very early, right when you arrive that day or the next day. Get it done, get it clear, dial it in, set it, and forget it. And that leads me to the expo and all of the other race experiences. There are so many components of race week that are really fun. There's the parade of nations. There's the underwear run. There's the expo with everything and all of the equipment out there. There are so many things to go do, look and see, but they can also deplete you. Going around and around the expo, standing out in the sun, waiting for the parade of nations, whatever it might be. So I just encourage you to really choose carefully. Make sure you identify the ones that you think will be fun. 
establish a time that you're going to go to the expo, and you should go to the expo, do a circuit, talk, have a look, buy whatever you want to buy, and then forget about it. I think if you can identify one to two experiences that you go and do in that Hawaii week and then forget about the rest, you are going to be better served systemically and you won't feel like you've spent the whole week just traipsing around Disneyland. Really important. Now, for you very busy folks out there that are still going to continue to run, this scheduling and planning really helps with you then putting in blocks of work that maybe you have to do back at home. Schedule your meetings well ahead of time. Ensure that you put your out of office in. Make sure that you give yourself time that you can spend restoring. Because if you can restore systemically, get out of the heat, chill, watch movies, read, whatever it might be, it's going to help you. With this organization, I think that you can already see it's a busy, busy week over there. So to finish up part one, let's go very quickly into the hit list. These are common questions that athletes ask us all the time, and I think they're important. Some of the big tips that I can give you. The first one, most common one, air conditioning. Should you sleep with air conditioning? The answer to this is yes. It is your biggest weapon to systemic freshness. Now, this is the really important because the mission here is to try and protect the integrity of your sleep quality and duration. Any more future heat adaptation occurs during the day when you're training or walking around in the expo, heading out to lunch, whatever it might be. And so that part of restoration, really high quality sleep, is not the time that you want to deprive yourself of a really high quality environment. The only athletes that would not have air conditioning are those that really have adverse reactions to that forced air that tends to occur. But the vast majority, air conditioning, yes, please. What about hydration? So many athletes ask us, how should we hydrate? It's really important. It's important pre-travel. And then you want to continue your protocol. But don't obsess. In the morning, drink your 20 ounces of fluid with electrolytes. Before you go to bed, drink your 20 ounces of fluid with electrolytes. Glasses of water, maybe with a pinch of salt when you're in the Hawaii environment with every single meal. And then throughout the rest of the day, a few sips here and there. But you are not a camel. You don't need to obsess on hydration. It's important. Question four is carb loading. The big one. Well, Carbohydrates are important. You do need to refuel. You do need to restock. But I will counter that with so is protein. Don't forget protein, particularly on your evening meals. In general, I like to make post-training breakfast in Hawaii the biggest meal of the day. Also, a good lunch, making sure that it's a combination of protein and carbohydrates. And then in the evening, some carbohydrate, but a a meal that is centered around protein that's going to really help you. In the last 72 hours before the race, you maybe just increase your starchy carbohydrates a little bit, but you don't need to become a foie gras goose. You don't need to force feed yourself. Just increase it a little bit, remembering that your training load is really, really light in those last 72 hours. AM breakfast, post-workout every time, big breakfast, And then in the last 48 hours before the actual race day, encourage you to limit really high fiber foods. We want to get the GI system operating cleanly, but we don't want any runny tummies. Outside of that, system stress, realize that when you're training, your pace might be slower, your heart rate might be higher, and all of that stuff that can mess with your head, but don't worry about it. Have fun. Now, if some of this information is, wow, wow. I should mention at this point, if you are heading to Hawaii and you want to have some individual attention, we'd be happy to set up a consultation with you. If you want to have a chat with myself or a Purple Patch coach, all you have to do is head to info at purplepatchfitness.com, drop us an email, info at purplepatchfitness.com, and we would be delighted to help. I know that it is challenging. I know that it's stressful. There's a lot of logistics, but we can get through by keeping things pretty simple for you. Globally, if you set up your week in advance, you arrive fit and fresh, you manage and work the schedule, and then, well, 
you're in a place where you can step on the start line, at least cross the timing mat and get in the water and be physically and mentally prepared to give it your very best effort on the race. Let's move to part two, race execution. We want to talk about three main things here. The first is successful strategies for race day in Kono, mindset and execution. We want to also talk a little bit about race craft, and that becomes important. How do you get whatever fitness that you have to work with you for the best outcome in Hawaii? And then finally, once we're all done, we'll wrap up the show by talking about post-race, what you should think about post-race. And so without further ado, let's get going on this. Let's start with strategies. And I think that it's important that we commence a discussion around Hawaii Ironman race day with our mindset and execution. What I'm going to first do is filter out some of you guys, the 5% of athletes that are really competitive, highly experienced, the pros, the very serious amateurs that are not time starved, that are maybe chasing and have aspirations of getting on the podium, winning their age group, winning overall amateur. Those types of folks, some of what I talk about here absolutely applies, but some of it equally doesn't. And I'm going to try and let you know when you do this. But the majority of what I'm talking about today is for the 95% of athletes that are participating in Hawaii, where maybe there's still a spread of experience and there's even a spread of performance level. But globally, 95% of athletes are time starved, have busy lives, are looking for their best personal performance within context of their life, seeking individual success, but are not defined by winning the whole thing or getting on the podium, that side of stuff. And so for that 95%, what does success look like? Let's hold hands here and let's think about defining success at this race. I see so many athletes spending cycles and cycles analyzing and predicting what their splits are going to be in Hawaii. The truth is that the Hawaii Ironman, more than any other race, has the broadest variability of what the conditions can bring and how they can imprint what makes a great performance. There's sea conditions with currents and waves and other components like that. There's wind and heat and humidity, lots of variability. Is it a still day? Is it a cloud-covered day? Is there high wind, whatever it might be, on the bike, and then imprint that onto the run? And that means that a, quote, fast year in the Hawaii Ironman or a slow year can have a huge delta. There could be 5, 10, 15 minutes of difference in the swim that are both equally good. There can be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes of slower bike riding that still makes up a really good bike performance. And so if you want your best race performance, the truth is that it's never going to come from you chasing splits. Having predetermined ideas of what you want to swim, what you want to bike, and what you want to run, and trying to adhere a race plan to that is a fool's errand. Instead, success is going to come about through an element of control, really smart self-management, a great amount of persistence, and continued problem solving over all of the challenges that you will meet across the whole of the day. And so I would say that a great success for the vast majority of Hawaii Ironman World Championship athletes isn't actually about racing in the classic sense that we think of that word. In fact, if you can be successful in the following, if you can swim without depleting your resources, swallowing vast amounts of ocean water and avoiding big fatigue, and then you can ride to your train potential, but complete that 180 kilometers and 112 miles with mental and physical resources left over, and you are not too dehydrated, and you have great substrate availability, and then you can go on and be consistent on the run, not fast, but consistent, in which you can, for the majority of that marathon, maintain good running most of the time, probably with walk breaks, and be on top of it all, 
really resilient mentally and physically and strong in the last 10K of the marathon, if you can do all of that and then you have a great Kona race performance. And the reason I draw it out like that is that this is less about racing. It's much more around self-management, patience, taking consistent action in order for you to preserve physical and mental readiness for that last two hours of racing. No matter how long it takes you to race, if you can get to your last two hours and be physically and mentally strong, bingo. Now, it reminds me of a story, 2015. I'm going to give you some data here. This is at the pointy end of the race. This is at the world-class level. And I remember watching the female, the women's pro race in 2015. Off the bike, it was a long way back. But off the bike, Sarah Piampiano was in 23rd place. Now, she's a good runner, but she came bursting out of T2. And I said to her, calm. The one moment I got to say, stay calm, don't overrun it. She recovered. She got into rhythm. 23rd place, a long, long, long way back. Minutes and minutes and minutes behind the 10th place runner. By mile five, she was in 18th place. That's a nice steady build up, 23rd to 18th. It's really good. At mile 10, she was ninth. And she finished seventh. So she went from 18th to 9th in a 30 to 40 win minute window in the pro race. 30 to 40 minutes she gained. She went from 23rd to 18th to 9th, boom, 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 all the way up in the world-class field that was. And the key thing is she wasn't having some magical run performance. She was just consistent. What was happening was the explosions of people's performance ahead of her. Now, this is the pro race. Now, let's take that story and think about time-starved amateurs. So what does this all wrap up? There's something that you can take away from this that I hope that you can apply with confidence to your own racing journey. Here's your race strategy for you. I think that you should go and train all day. Train all day. I encourage you to diffuse the occasion and instead take a highly practical approach. Imagine, rather than it being the Hawaii Ironman World Championships, imagine you were foolish enough to allow me to coach you. Goodness me, can you imagine the poor people that have to put up with me? But imagine I was coaching you and you told me, again, another mistake. I've got all train day to train on Saturday. And on Wednesday, you get up and you look at your weekend prescribed workouts and you say, holy shit, what's he doing? Because I've prescribed on that Saturday 2.4 miles of swimming. And then I say, get out as quickly as you can. Get onto the bike. I want you to go and ride 112 miles. And after that, I want to challenge you. You're going to go and run 26.2 miles. And you're going to do this all while you're on holiday in Kona. It's very cruel. And the first action that you might take is to go and find another coach. But practically, I'm sure if you saw that and you took on the challenge, you'd be smart you'd probably make sure that you rested up a little bit, you fueled, you hydrated, you tried to get some good sleep, and then you'd probably start really smooth. And you wouldn't try and be a hero on the first part of the bike. You'd just be really consistent. You'd be steady. You would be focused on self-management. You wouldn't have any ego about this. All you're trying to do is prove a point to your dumb coach. And any roadblocks that you might navigate, such as flat tires along the way, or maybe you get a little bit fuzzy and loss of focus, you just fix them. And when the going gets tough, you're going to lean on your pride and maybe a little bit of your ego and a point to prove to your coach to make sure that I realize that you are tougher than you think. In other words, the more simple you can make the Hawaii Ironman, the better it is going to be. The more clear the more familiar, accessible, the more you just apply a training mindset, the better your race performance will be. You don't need to, ahead of this race, change everything, buy a bunch of new gadgets, evolve every piece of fueling and hydration that you typically do. Start guessing how long it's going to take you or your splits. Just look after yourself. Stay consistent and your outcome will be the best. 
go and train all day. Do this and you will be best served. Now, before you think, oh, he's diminishing expectations, realize, remember, I have personally coached multiple age group world champions, professional Ironman champions across the whole of the world to great success adopting this mindset. It can be liberating, but in addition, it's practical. And I promise you, that's what Kona demands. It demands that you don't race with ego, you have deploy pragmatism. So let's talk about the key elements around race craft. Now, this could go on all day, and I'm going to try and do a quick and dirty around Kona specific swim, bike, and run. We'll talk about fueling and hydration a little bit, where we'll go through each of the main disciplines as quickly as we can. The swim. I think there are a few points around the swim that are critically important. Let's talk about the Kona swim. It is warm. It is congested. It is tidal, of course. It can often be very wavy. Going out, the way the tides work, it tends to be that you won't achieve a negative split. In other words, you tend to have to swim against the little current on the way back. It tends to take longer coming back. It is also emotionally challenging because it's effectively a straight line, a little cuss, and a straight line. Swim that way for a mile, swim back a mile. That's pretty much it. Now, while it's wide and there's a lot of space, it also is in moving water. And the beauty of the crystal clear water is you can see the bottom. And that amplifies the risk of seasickness because you're swimming and moving while the floor of the ocean, at least I think typically, is not moving. And so we've got to think about this in this more demanding swim. You add to it the warmth of the water. You can have a little bit of overheating that starts and it's very salty. And with the choppy turbulence and the fact you're doing it with a couple of thousands of your friends, even with the new wave starts, you are going to ingest some fluids in this. So in other words, ultimately it is, I hate to tell you this, a tough swim. So I would recommend in the swim that you line up relative to your pace and the vast majority of athletes benefit from lining up to the side of whatever wave you're in. Give yourself options to get out of the congestion. If you're right in the nucleus, you're going to get hit and you're going to get hit a lot. There is a lot of contact in this amplified testosterone fueled swim. Begin, stay calm. And the number one thing that's going to help you relative to your trained fitness is to swim in a straight line. Now, how do you navigate the mental challenge of this where it just feels like you're on a swimming treadmill? It's a long out. It's a long back. The best way to approach this is to break it down into sections. Now you have buoys every hundred meters. And so you can do buoy counting. That might help. But I really like athletes to take a little bit more of an interval mindset to ensure that they are gathering water and accelerating water back as strong as they can, restoring and resetting mentally. So a simple pattern might be something like 100 strokes where you're really focused and strong, 20 or 25 strokes where you allow yourself to reset, find connection, refine form, have a little bit of double sighting so that you really ensure you're swimming in a straight line. 100 on, 25 off, 100 on, 25 off. Suddenly you've got two and a half miles that are broken down into sections to keep you on task. Very, very good to make it a process driven side of things. Now, before we move on to the bike, a couple of other things. Sighting becomes really important. The buoys are critical. On your way back, I would try and stay as close as you can to the buoy line. And the sighting ahead of you are gonna be the main hotels, the King Cam hotels. Those are going to be the guides for you to get home. You'll swim to the right side of the pier, and then you are going to exit. Now, with the time of the swim and the turbulence of the swim, I would take your time coming out of the water. Don't be rushed. Be really pragmatic. Take time to rinse off most athletes and hydrate in T1. In fact, this is where, this is one of the detours, the more accomplished higher level athletes they're waiting to fuel. But for 90% of Kona athletes, it's probably a good time to actually get calories in you in T1 
take in your time, get some hydration, half a bottle of fluid, then get on the bike and settle. I think it becomes really important. The last thing that I'll say about this swim is you will get zero, zero insights into how your day is going by looking at your finish time of this swim. It will almost certainly be slower than your regular Ironman swims. And there is a huge delta depending on currents and conditions. And so don't look at it and think I'm a hero or a zero relative to the outcome of your swim. I hope that helps. Overall implement, swim in a straight line, best of luck. The bike course, there is no flat riding on this course. On paper, the actual terrain profile of this course is not difficult, and yet it destroys athletes. And so you can overcome the destruction by being really smart. Post-swim, going through town, lots of crowds, very busy, exciting, patience and settle, really, really calm. In fact, when you're in town, you want to think more about trying to settle in and beginning your fueling and hydration. You're going to have a lot of external stimulus, all of the crowds, all of the twists and turns, begin your fueling. And then as you go through the sections of the course, there are a few things to point out. You've got the first section all the way up, about 35 miles going up the Queen K, the main high rate. That is where you want to be very calm very smooth. Don't get frustrated by some of the groups that might start to cluster there. Just participate, and do the best you can, and don't forget to fuel and hydrate. You've then got a long climb up to Harvey. They say it's 19 or 20 miles. It's not really. The climb is a time where you want to A, fuel and hydrate. Big mistakes occur. People forget as you start to feel the first resistance coming up. But this is where you want to start to use the terrain, looking to achieve wheel speed on the rollers rather than just riding at a constant power. And as and know this as you go up the climb, the bottom of the climb feels very easy. Typically, you have a little bit of a tailwind pushing you. As you navigate towards the turnaround, which is the town of Harvey, that's where the winds tend to start to pick up if there are winds and the grade picks up. The last four or five miles becomes a little bit more of a traditional climb. That becomes important. So it's a really well-managed portion of it. When you make the turn through town, fuel and hydrate. And then the descent, I think a really important part of the race. You are going to come back down that long road. The first four or five miles, fast, easy. You want to think about making sure you're staying supple on the bike. If there is wind staying really controlled, allowing your leg speed to pick up and be lighter, but you can't forget to fuel and hydrate. If you have a hard time hydrating at high speed, you want to make sure that at that turnaround, you've done a good job of gulping in a whole bunch of calories and getting them into your system as you're coming downhill. I would say the big surprise on that downhill is folks think mistakenly that once they make the turn, their next 20 miles is just going to be fast and easy. As you get to the bottom, the last five, six, or seven miles before you are finishing that descent, there is plenty of work to be done. It can be very challenging sometimes. And so control your bike and don't forget to fuel and hydrate. Once you hit the bottom, you've got a nasty hot little climb for about a mile. That's not very nice. And then it is the last 35 miles heading into home. You are back on the Queen K, the famous highway. And typically, you're going to be faced with a headwind. I would say this is the most emotional part of the bike course, very challenging. And if you can retain good bike position and posture, maintain your fueling and hydration to keep your resources up and stay mentally strong for the first 25 to 30 miles of that 30 mile, 35 mile section, it is hugely valuable in time gained relative to your overall splits, you're actually having a really good bike split relative to your train potential, but also setting you up for a really good run. It reminds me of another story in 2009. At this point, now Chris Lieto, clearly in this race, the strongest bike rider in the whole of the field. But at this point, he's only got 35 miles to go of the 112. At that turn onto the Queen K, he was give or take about 60 seconds ahead of the main group. 60 seconds, 
that's not a big enough lead against the fleet-footed runners. By the end of the bike, 35 miles later, he had an 11-minute lead on the group. Now, there was some wind factor in there. There was the fact that the winds were shifting. He got a little bit lucky. He didn't get into some of the cross and headwinds that came a little bit down that section of road. But the interesting thing is his power output for that last 35 miles stayed very similar. He didn't up the effort. He just paced his bike very, very well. He ended up coming second in that race, and it was all anchored around a great, patient riding performance. If Chris can do it like that, I think it's worthwhile you taking the same approach. So let's dive into the run. I told you it was a robust episode today, guys. I hope you've got your pens and paper still scribbling. The run is becoming an important part of your race day, isn't it? Don't expect to feel special coming off the bike. You are going to come off the bike and you are going to go through what they call hot corner and out onto a leahy drive. This is where you're going to have your best crowd support of the whole day until the finish line. And that means it's really important that you stay calm, that you don't have any judgment on how you feel, that you look to retain or maintain or create great posture and settle. It is really important as you run up along the coast, a leahy drive, that you lock into rhythm, you look after your substrate, so your fueling, your hydration, and you begin a run-walk strategy. What do I mean here? Run-walk strategy. The vast majority of Hawaii Ironman athletes are going to have their best race performance by strategically implementing walking. And there are two levels to this that we need to go through. The first is deploy any walking you do relative to the terrain that you're on. Like the bike ride, there's actually very little flat running. It tends to be either slightly uphill grade or slightly downhill grade. And what that means is if you are going to walk, and I recommend that you do, if you are going to walk, strategically walk when the speed penalty is low. When that's low is either in the aid stations because you're able to do something useful there, refuel, rehydrate, or on an uphill grade. Walking on an uphill grade, less of a speed penalty. You should also begin your walk breaks before you are desperate. So don't wait until there's physical decline and you have to do it early and often. That's why I talk about starting it at the front part of the race course. Practicing training and then implement. But on the flip side of implementing walking when there is less of a speed penalty, you equally want to try and minimize walking when the speed penalty is great, and that's on downhill grades. So remember this, if I'm going to walk, do it on an uphill grade. When I see a downhill grade, I'm running, period. Gold. Good stuff. Now, what I recommend on run-walk strategies is something that gives you a management tool. So you might start and this is middle of the bell curve, so I, I can't give you an individual prescription on a show like this. But let's imagine that you're going to start your run walking while we've got the terrain in the back of our head with somewhere around eight minutes of running and 45 to 60 seconds of walking. Eight one, eight one, eight one. If you really start to decline and that eight minutes is impossible for you to hold good running form on, then you should strategically move down and shorten the run. You might go to a six minute, six and one, six and one, six and one. And then if your legs start to crumble even more, you might move to a four minute, then a two minute. And even if you're going minute on, minute off, as you're coming home, you are still managing the run. And that is very different than running until you explode and then being forced to walk a mile at a time. And that happens a lot in this race. And so it becomes really, really important. Coming back to the course, you've got your out and back. You then go up the Polani Hill, about 400 meters of uphill grade. Most athletes should be power walking up there. Apart from the very point in, most are going to be power walking. And then you have the daunting emotional part of the race, the out and back on the Queen K. This is what you've really been trying to do over the course of all of the swim, out of the swim, the bike, and the front part of the run is to deliver yourself to this part. 
And the athletes that have underfueled, underhydrated, overworked, and haven't done a good job in pacing, this is the point of the race that many crumble. If you can be strong, consistent, and in a management mindset all the way out, the famous energy lab, all the way back, your race performance is great. And so it's all about delivering yourself with patience and persistence to this point. Now, let me add to finish up the show a couple of points on fueling and hydration. The simple truth is you heard me talk about the bike and I said, hydrate, 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 fuel, fuel, fuel. You can't catch up on hydration. And so why, that's why I focus so much on this. You should be hydrating in this race with a high electrolyte solution that has low calories. It's very, very difficult to hydrate enough in the Hawaii Ironman if you have got high calorie concentration in the bottle as well. Start early, never skip, never miss. We want to get off the bike not too dehydrated. You're not going to maintain hydration status, but not too dehydrated. Very, very important. Okay. On the fueling, learn what works for you in advance and have a plan. It becomes really important. If you want some numbers, as a baseline, I think each of you should be riding at consuming 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour or more. Now, the way that a lot of our athletes tend to implement it is the first couple of hours, they're very sugar-focused, gels, blocks, chews, that kind of type of component. In the middle of the bike ride, they may be a bit more macro-focused, so energy bars, maybe supplemented with some gels, but a little bit of fat and protein in there as well. And then as they hit the back end of the bike all the way through the run, they shift back to the sugars. That becomes the general rule. But it's important that you find out what works for you. All right. A couple of final snippets that become really critical. And I think this is important. I hope that this last little section around race day execution is the stuff that you can remember and draw on when you're in the heat of the moment. Number one. Remember this, how you feel at any moment has no reflection of how you might feel for the rest of the race. And so if you are going through a dark patch, and every athlete does, take action. Don't judge yourself, stay strong mentally and be patient, but take action. It becomes really important. How you feel now isn't how you have to feel for the rest of the race. So don't let your mind drive you into a pit of despair. Number two, self-management. Some of the action I ask you to take, this is where we can get granular and practical. If you've got GI distress, your stomach feels bloated, you're feeling a little bit burpy, keep hydrating, but don't fuel for a while. You need to get the calories passing through the system. Okay, so keep hydrating, electrolytes are okay, but you want to dilute the calories that are in the stomach. That's a good general rule of thumb. On the flip side, if you're riding or running along and you're starting to lose motivation, you get grumpy, moody, you get frustrated with the person that brushed by you, you start to lose focus, maybe a little bit dizzy, you need calories. And it doesn't matter what your fueling plan is, you need sugar. Get it in you really important. Stretches where you feel great, you feel wonderful, the legs are powerful, you're excited, this is the best experience, fuel and hydrate. It's a great time to take on calories as it is at the top of the descent. Fuel and hydrate when you feel good. And finally, expect in this race to go through some serious lows. It's normal. All you have to do is work your way through them. And so, as I said, as your race strategy, train all day. If you can train all day, you're going to be in a great place. Oh, and one more thing before I let you go. You are allowed to have fun. You realize that. This is a magical experience. So for you guys out there that are newcomers, this is your first Hawaii Ironman experience. I want you to do something for you. And I want you to Enable yourself to have fun. But there are two components in this life experience that you're going to take on. There are two components that are important. The first is at the start. There is nothing like the start of the Hawaii Ironman. 
And so give yourself plenty of time, get checked in, get your bike sorted, pump your tires, but get into the water a little bit early and swim out, tread water, turn around and pause. And look at the sun coming up behind, the mountains behind, the venue that is the experience and set a little bit of gratitude for you being there and have a smile on your face because you're just about to take on the biggest challenge of your life, but also one of the most special things in your life. And so set the gratitude and carry that mindset throughout the day. To bookend it, no matter what challenges you've overcome, no matter what adversity, no matter whether you've had a magical day or a day that's full of lessons to grow for for next time, finish. Do everything you can to finish. And when you finish, that last mile, that very last mile, reflect, pause, and don't let that occasion bypass you. Because it will be the only time in your life that you run that last mile of the Hawaii Ironman and go down that magical chute and immerse in the environment and the celebration. And don't let that occasion bypass you because it is very, very special. It is one of the most special things in sport. And so I encourage you at the start line and at the finish line, enable that to cement the memories of everything that you're gonna have to navigate. Enjoy it after your race, give yourself 72 hours, pause, reflect, celebrate, eat whatever you want, but don't go into analysis. If you have a great day, wonderful. If you have a challenging day that's full of lessons, that happens, it's a growth opportunity. Give yourself 72 hours, then start moving the body, and then have an honest reflection and conversation with yourself. How did you do in preparation? An honest assessment of your training, your systemic health, how you navigated race week. What did you do well on race day? What were areas that you could improve? There is never a single reason for a great race performance. And equally, there is never a culprit, a single culprit of why things don't go well. The biggest question you can ask yourself is on that day, with everything that happened, good or bad, did you try your very best? Did you do everything that you could do to deliver yourself to a great race performance? And if the answer is yes, and then there is opportunity for growth and learning across the board. I hope it goes well. I'll be out there all week. I hope that this helped you and I wish you the very best of luck. Take care. Guys, thanks so much for joining and thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the new format. You can never miss an episode by simply subscribing. Head to the Purple Patch channel of YouTube and you will find it there and you could subscribe. Of course, I'd like to ask you, if you will subscribe, also share it with your friends and it's really helpful if you leave a nice positive review in the comments. Now, any questions that you have, let me know, feel free to add a comment and I will try my best to respond and support you on your performance journey. And in fact, as we commence this video podcast experience, if you have any feedback at all, as mentioned earlier in the show, we would love your help in helping us to improve. Simply email us at info at purplepatchfitness.com or leave it in the comments of the show at the Purple Patch page and we will get you dialed in. We'd love constructive feedback. We are in a growth mindset, as we like to call it. And so feel free to share with your friends. But as I said, let's build this together. Let's make it something special. It's really fun. We're really trying hard to make it a special experience. And we want to welcome you into the Purple Patch community. With that, I hope you have a great week. Stay healthy, have fun, keep smiling, doing whatever you do. Take care.